I am Dr. Jason Johnson, one of the Pediatric Cardiology Fellows at Duke University, and this is a video annotated PowerPoint about Tetralogy of Fallot. This presentation will go over the prevalence of Tetralogy of Fallot and the pathophysiology, including the clinical features. I will also discuss how the diagnosis of Tetralogy of Fallot is made and the management of these patients. As you might expect, we will focus on Tetralogy of Fallot as a form of congenital heart disease. Tetralogy of Fallot is the most common form of cyanotic congenital heart disease in childhood. As you remember, the definition of cyanosis is systemic desaturations. Depending upon the study, the incidence is reported from 0.3 to 0.5 per 1,000 live births, and it is equal in male and females. Patients with tetralogy of flow can have other associated abnormalities. Around 8 to 23 percent of patients with tetralogy of Fallot have 22q11 deletion, also known as DeGeorge syndrome. About 15 percent of patients with allergial syndrome have tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy of Fallot is caused by anterior deviation of the infundibular septum, which is the portion of the muscular septum that separates the aortic and pulmonary outflows. This single deviation leads to four major problems. Pulmonary stenosis, a ventricular septal defect, the aorta that overrides the ventricular septum, and right ventricular hypertrophy. The degree of pulmonary outflow obstruction determines the degree of the patient's cyanosis. The pulmonary valve size may vary from normal to severely hypoplastic. This is a figure from Nelson's textbook of pediatrics, and it depicts the physiology of tetralogy of flow. First, we will evaluate the figure and identify the four abnormalities of this heart that define tetralogy of flow. You can see the pulmonary stenosis, the ventricular septal defect, the aortic valve that overrides the ventricular septal defect, and the right ventricular hypertrophy. The circled numbers represent oxygen saturation values. The numbers next to the arrows represent volumes of blood flow in liters per minute per meter squared. The right atrial oxygen saturation is decreased because of systemic hypoxemia. A volume of 3 liters per minute per meter squared of desaturated blood enters the right atrium and traverses the tricuspid valve. 2 liters flows through the right ventricle outflow tract into the lungs, whereas 1 liter shunts right to left through the ventricular septal defect into the ascending aorta. Thus, the pulmonary blood flow is two-thirds normal, or the QP to QS is 0.7 to 1, with the Q designating flow. Blood flow returning to the left atrium is fully saturated only two liters of blood flow across the mitral valve. Oxygen saturation in the left ventricle may be slightly decreased because of the right to left shunting across the VSD. Two liters of saturated left ventricular blood mixing with one liter of desaturated right ventricular blood is ejected into the ascending aorta. The aortic saturation is decreased and cardiac output is normal. Now we will talk in more detail about the pathophysiology regarding Tetralogy of Fallot. The VSD is non-restrictive, large, and located below the aortic valve. In 20% of patients with Tetralogy of Fallot, the aortic arch courses over the right bronchus instead of the left bronchus. The most important thing to remember about Tetralogy of Fallot is that patients are desaturated or cyanotic due to the right-to-left shunting at the VSD. Due to the pulmonary stenosis, deoxygenated blood is shunted from the right ventricle across the VSD to the aorta. This blood bypasses the lungs and does not become oxygenated. Therefore, deoxygenated blood enters the systemic circulation and creates cyanosis. The pressure in both ventricles are equal due to the large ventricular septal defect. However, this increase in pressure 
of the right ventricle is not translated to the pulmonary arteries due to the pulmonary stenosis. It should be noted that if patients have mild to moderate pulmonary valve stenosis, there is a balance across the VSD. This can limit the amount of deoxygenated blood entering the systemic circulation, and patients may not be cyanotic. Clinical features vary according to the age of the patient. In infants with severe right ventricular outflow obstruction, neonatal cyanosis is noted. Pulmonary blood flow may be dependent on flow through the ductus arteriosus. Older, unrepaired children have dyspnea on exertion. Children assume a squatting position for the relief of dyspnea. This causes an increase in blood flow to the right ventricle in an attempt to force blood across the stenotic pulmonary valve. Substernal right ventricular impulse can be detected. Systolic thrill is felt along the left sternal border in the third and fourth parasternal spaces. Systolic ejection murmur is loud and harsh at the left upper sternal border. The murmur can actually become less prominent with severe obstruction, especially during a hypercyanotic spell. This slide is very important and is commonly tested on regarding patients of Tetralogy of Fallot. Paroxysmal hypercyanotic attacks, or TET spells, can occur at any age. The infant becomes hypercyanotic and restless. Cyanosis increases, gasping respirations ensue, and syncope may follow. The spells occur most frequently in the morning or during vigorous crying. Temporary disappearance in intensity of the systolic ejection murmur as flow across the right ventricular outflow tract diminishes is common. Infants who are only mildly cyanotic at rest are often more prone to the development of hypoxic spells. As mentioned in the previous slide, older children will squat to overcome these hypercyanotic attacks and is a common presentation of TET spells in children 2-3 to three years of age. The treatment of hypercyanotic attacks involves promoting blood flow across the pulmonary valve and not across the VSD. The first measure involves calming and holding the infant in the knee-to-chest position. This decreases the amount of pulmonary vascular resistance, calming the child, and the knee-to-chest position promotes increased blood volume to the right ventricle. The administration of oxygen and morphine also promote a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. Beta blockade is used typically with propanolol to decrease right ventricular hypercontractility and heart rate and to increase systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. Increasing SVR, typically with IV phenylephrine, improves right ventricular outflow by limiting blood flow from the right ventricle through the VSD. Rapid correction of metabolic acidosis with IV sodium bicarbonate decreases pulmonary vascular resistance. Many different imaging modalities are used to diagnose tetralogy of flow. However, the transthoracic echocardiogram is the gold standard mode of diagnosis. As you would expect, an electrocardiogram will show right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy. The chest x-ray shows a boot-shaped heart due to the increase in size of the right side of the heart that causes the apex of the heart to move leftward and superior to give the appearance of a boot. The echocardiogram, besides defining the diagnosis, will define the extent of pulmonary stenosis and other associated anomalies. Cardiac catheterization is not typically used, but it is utilized in complicated cases to define coronary artery anatomy and pulmonary artery anatomy. Cardiac MRI is commonly used to define right ventricular volumes in post-operative patients. Here are some images from the different modalities used to diagnose Tetralogy of Fallot. The top left image is a chest x-ray that shows the narrow base concavity of the left heart border in the area usually occupied by the pulmonary artery with normal overall heart size. The hypertrophied right ventricle causes the rounded apical shadow to be uplifted and thus results in a boot-shaped cardiac silhouette. The top right image is an echocardiogram and demonstrates anterior displacements of the outflow ventricular septum that resulted in stenosis of the subpulmonic right ventricular outflow tract, overriding of the aorta, 
and an associated ventricular septal defect. This image shows the hypertrophied right ventricle, the large ventricular septal defect, and the overriding aorta. The bottom image is a 12-lead electrocardiogram that shows right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, with dominant R wave in the right precordial chest leads, or an RSR prime pattern, and right atrial enlargement. The management of tetralogy flow mainly depends upon the severity of the right ventricular outflow obstruction. Neonates with severe pulmonary stenosis or atresia require prostaglandin infusion to keep the ductus arteriosus patent. These patients typically require a palliative systemic to pulmonary artery shunt to restore pulmonary blood flow prior to their final corrective surgery. Complete surgical repair is required. This involves relief of the pulmonary stenosis with a transannular patch and closure of the VSD, and it typically occurs at four to six months of age. This slide is an example of both a palliative systemic to pulmonary artery shunt and a full corrective repair. The image on the left shows the physiology of a systemic to pulmonary artery, or Blalock-Tausig, shunt in a patient with the tetralogy of Fallot. Again, the circled numbers represent oxygen saturation values, blood shunting left to right across the shunt from the right subclavian artery to the right pulmonary artery increases total pulmonary blood flow and results in a higher oxygen saturation that would exist without the shunt. The image on the right shows a complete repair with patch closure of the VSD and a transannular patch repair of the pulmonary stenosis. The prognosis of patients with tetralogy of Fallot depends upon several factors, but is typically good. After successful total correction, patients are typically asymptomatic. Patients are evaluated the rest of their life for residual pulmonary stenosis, subsequent pulmonary regurgitation, and right ventricular size and function. Echocardiogram and cardiac MRI are utilized often to evaluate right ventricular volume, and provide information to guide when and if replacement of the right ventricular outflow tract is needed. Postoperative right bundle branch block is typical, and following the cure restoration on ECG is important. The cure restoration is a predictor of arrhythmia and sudden death. Holter monitor and exercise testing to assess potential ventricular tachycardia is used especially in patients with a history of a ventriculotomy or a cut along the right ventricle. These are several references to a review article and a book chapter that summarize Tetralogy of Fallot very well. Thank you for your time.